Hello and welcome to the New York City uh, Category Theory Seminar. Today we're going to have Tobias Fritz talk about categorical probability and the DeFinati theorem. Take it away. Oh, one second, Tobias, before, and we have this uh, tradition where you, before you start, you tell us where you did your undergraduate, where you did your graduate degree, who's your thesis advisor, where you're now. Tell us about yourself. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm a mathematician and with a strong interest also in, in theoretical physics, and I got my undergrad degree, at, um, my master's at the University of Münster in Germany. Um, and did my PhD at the Max Planck Institute in Bonn with uh, Matilda Marcoli. Um, and so got into a kind of foundations of, of, that was kind of operator algebras and foundations of quantum mechanics at the time. Um, and so I've been kind of been moving around, but always been interested in category theory. Um, and so now I recently landed at um, the University of Innsbruck in Austria right in between the Alps. Um, and so, so that's the rough sketch. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, take it away. Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, even if last week I um, just kind of slept through half of my talk <laughs> because of time zone issues, um, which I, sh I, sh I should know. I mean, I've crossed the Atlantic so many times myself. Um, that, that I should know there's a two week delay, two week difference when, when daylight savings time starts. Um, anyway, so the advantage is that um, in contrast to last week, we now actually have, um, oh, the slides are not, sorry, just need to, okay. In contrast to last week, we actually have a proof of the Definetti theorem. Um, maybe I should be a little bit cautious and say that, well, it has survived a few days of scrutiny um, and I think I, I can I can announce it now publicly, um, but still I, I feel like maybe I should be a little cautious with that. Um, so so this is still still needs to be written up. <clears throat> um, but but yeah, I guess the proof is also not not sure how much detail I can really go into it. But but I'm happy to if people want to hear about it. All right, but let me start um, kind of the really basic things and, and, and also just to get kind of references out of the way. Um, I don't really want to say much about this other than that maybe I think the, the um, most of what I'm going to say is from the, these um, first two papers listed here, which kind of have been setting the stage for categorical probability um, in terms of these um, Markov categories. Um, so, so this is Markov categories. I'm going to talk about one particular approach for how to do probability theory in categorical terms. Um, but there's certainly also other, other ones and, and other things that one can do. And for that, I'd like to refer to the workshop um, that we had last summer um, online, obviously. And, and so all the recordings are available. Um, and so you can just well, it's uh, the link on my slides. You can also just go there and, and, and see what else there is in categorical probability. It was the first workshop of that kind. Um, so let me give a brief kind of motivation of why one would want to pursue something like a categorical approach to probability. Um, and I can think of a, a number of reasons. Uh, and so these are in no particular order of, of um, I'm not trying to rank them or anything, um, but there's uh, certainly applications to probabilistic programming. So there's a, a community um, of computer scientists who study um, probabilistic programming languages and their semantics. And that naturally has a lot of overlap with, I mean, uses categorical methods. And since somehow probabilistic things um, figure into the topic that somehow naturally also leads to categorical probability. Another thing that, that another feature that a categorical approach gives us is that we can prove theorems in greater generality. So usually probability theory is based on measure theory. Um, and then one proves um, theorems based on the measure theoretic axioms like Kolmogorov's axioms. But if we have um, 
categorical axioms, then we are, we are more flexible concerning the semantics and we can interpret it also, at least try to interpret it in other contexts too, like non-determinism, for example, non-determinism is similar to probability, right? And in, in that is somehow both describes um, things that are somehow random in some sense. Another motivation is to sort out the interdependencies between the theorems. Um, and so, so this is similar to, to what's called reverse mathematics, that, that when you look at, um, try to really take apart what ingredients does the proof of a theorem actually need. And, and so this is somehow similar motivation, I guess, to, to the previous one. Uh, but somehow to, to understand the dependence of various statements in probability theory. Um, ultimately, one can hope to prove theorems that have higher complexity than the usual ones because the categorical machinery provides us with a more abstract um, language than we can hide the implementation details in the semantics. Um, and so that, that way we can, or, I mean, I'm sure you all know this also that um, try to phrase things ultimately of higher complexity. Uh, there may be pedagogical advantages that we can have ultimately try to achieve also simpler teaching of probability theory. If you can just draw string diagrams, that's a lot more intuitive. And ultimately we can also like, try to gain um, different, a new philosophical point of view on what probability is. I mean, there's a big philosophical debate on Bayesianism, frequentism, what our probability is actually about. Um, and one of the first things, first things that I'm going to say actually is sort of a new perspective on this, or I, I don't know if new or not, but, but a perspective on this based on the, this categorical approach. So, and, and that's what I'm, what I'm going to get into now. Um, so I don't want to actually start with probability, but I just want to start with, um, suppose that we want to reason about some kind of processes. Um, and then these processes um, somehow can have outputs that are not necessarily uniquely determined by the inputs. Um, and what kind of axiomatics is that going to lead us to naturally? So, so that means I'm going to look at uh, string diagrams um, and so we can compose processes and in, in, into networks described by string diagrams. Um, I assume you've all seen this kind of uh, diagram for, so we got apple pie out of the ingredients and individual processes that, that describe um, how the pie is made from these ingredients. Um, so, so this is just well known, I mean, standard stuff in string diagrams and symmetric monodal categories. But now comes the new thing. Um, now suppose that we want to reason about the flow of information in, in a medical trial. So suppose we want to, we have um, a potential candidate treatment um, for some sort of medical condition. Um, and we want to evaluate the, the efficacy of that treatment. Well, then we're going to have um, a sort of process, uh, some kind of composite process, um, which ultimately has the treatment outcome as its outcome. But what, and what figures into the treatment is both, um, or the, the treatment success, is both the medical condition of the patient, so that's the wire on the right, but also whether the patient actually complies with the treatment or not, that that's an important factor. And that compliance is itself determined by, or can, can, may depend on the medical condition. If the medical condition is more severe, then the patient is more likely to comply. So here we have this new thing um, that we now have two processes that depend on the medical condition. And so somehow we would like to have this extra kind of syntax 
that describes the idea of copying this information about a medical condition. Um, and, and so that's what the black dot indicates. We need to have, so in addition to just the usual diagrams, diagrammatics and symmetric monodal categories, we need to have this extra piece of syntax in order to talk about flow of information about the medical condition. So, so this suggests that a, a theory of information flow um, needs additional pieces of structure beyond just symmetric monodal category structure. So copying information um, and also then it's natural to also consider deletion of information as a piece of structure. So this leads to the definition of a Markov category. And so I know that there's no, I haven't mentioned probability yet. This is just about information flow so far. A symmetric monodal category equipped with um, such copying and deleting operations on every object. So for every X, we would have a, more, a distinguished morphism from X to X tensor X drawn as this sort of black um, fork. And then, well, yeah, these, these should satisfy it's natural then to postulate these, these axioms, these equations, which say that this copying and deleting corresponds or forms a commutative co-monoid. Um, and finally, the, the equation at the bottom says that if we well, delete, the output, delete the output of a process, then that's the same as if we had deleted the input to begin with. Um, and so this is saying that the, that the deletion operation is actually a natural transformation. So we have this, we have this deletion um, morphism for every object X going from X to the monodal unit. And that equation is saying that that deletion operation is, is natural, but there's no such condition for the copying. And I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, maybe it's worth mentioning now also, also concerning the references that, that there's also quantum versions um, of these Markov categories. And, and I've seen um, author uh, parsing that who's worked on this quite, quite a bit, I think actually is here as well. So he could also tell us more, I guess. So, so then these would describe um, semantically quantum versions of information flow. Um, but here, so in, in this context, one of the, to get to the examples so semantically, how, um, what, what, what is the possible semantics? The most basic kind of semantics is um, if we have stochastic matrices. So finite sets is our objects and uh, stochastic matrices is our morphisms, um, which means that a morphism is a, is a bunch of numbers, a matrix like, like this, um, F of Y given X and um, an entry of that matrix. So in, in the Y row and X column, it's just a probability to get the output Y, um, that, that, that a process outputs Y given the input X. And so then these should satisfy these conditions here. Obviously probabilities are, are no negative numbers and, and they're normalized. So that total probability to get some output is one for every input X. And composition is given by the, the chapman como gore formula. Um, so that is just, yeah, the sort of obvious thing. You multiply the probabilities because based on the assumption that the stuff that happens inside the processes um, these probabilities are basically operating independently. So that amounts to multiplying the probabilities and then summing over the intermediate thing because we're not looking at that. Okay, so then a morphism from sort of monoidal unit is the singleton one um, and a morphism P from one to any X is then just a probability distribution everything finite, discrete. 
And yeah, the general morphisms, I mean, other than stochastic matrices also come under many names. Um, Markov kernel and in information theory, those are also channels, communication channels. Um, probabilistic mapping is sometimes used. And so, so this is the category structure, but now I haven't said, but the monoidal structure and, and the Markov category structure actually is. So the mono, monoidal structure is just should be um, well, the Cartesian product at a level of objects, just product of finite sets. And um, the, at a level of morphisms, this amounts to, well, using when we, um, have two processes in parallel. The tensor product is based on the assumption that the probabilities are independent. Um, and so then again, just like in composition, we multiply them. So it's a G of X given A times F of Y given B. And the copy maps, so for, for the, the Markov category structure you now is, is also just the obvious thing that gives probability one if um, the two outputs are equal and equal to the input and probability zero otherwise. That, that, that's just not a formalization of, of the intuitive idea of copying the input. <clears throat> and the deletion maps are, well now, the, the unique morphisms to the monodal unit. There's basically the equation at the bottom is saying that the monodal unit is terminal. All right, any questions about this so far? Okay. So um, yeah, we can choose other kinds of semantics. I mean, if you really look at this, you'll, you'll notice that I haven't used anything about the real numbers, uh, anything about the probabilities being real valued. So we might as well just take the probabilities to take values in any semi-ring R. Um, and for example, we can take the Boolean semi-ring, which just consists of zero and one. Um, and instead of, well, define the addition such that one plus one is actually equal to one. Um, so, so this is an, an, an usual, usual multiplication. So this gives us a, a semi-ring, meaning just like a ring, but we don't have, we don't have negatives. We just have addition and multiplication and, and these satisfy the usual commutative monoid and distributivity axioms. Um, and if we apply the same construction with these coefficients, then we get the classic category of the non-empty finite power set monad. And, and so, so in, in this kind of, um, with this definition, we get a Markov category for non-determinism. So we're now um, a probability value of one can be interpreted as certain outcome is possible. And um, a probability value of zero would mean that the outcome is impossible. Prakash um, has a question. Yeah, just a quick remark. You said it can be any semi-ring, but is it important to emphasize that it's a positive semi-ring or not? So in a positive semi-ring, you have the axiom that if x plus y equals zero, then x and y are both zero. Because right. example, uh, so far, it's not, that's, that's not relevant. I mean, we can huh. as well just take all the real numbers, for example. Okay. Um, so then we just get negative probabilities. So at, at this point, that, that's perfectly fine. Um, but later on, I will impose conditions that, that will um, prevent this kind of thing, that, that will force and force positive non-negativity. Um, do you mind if I also ask a small question no, related please. to this? Um, if you take like um, the category that you introduced earlier, stochastic maps, can you take like the, um, what is it, the ceiling function um, and use that to define like a functor to um, this non-deterministic uh, category? Right, so, so we can um, um, kind of truncate probabilities by saying that we consider every non-zero non probability, we map that to one, we consider it possible. 
and zero probability we consider impossible. And, and so then, yes, we got a functor from Finstock to the classic category for non-empty finite powers at monads. Okay, cool, um, thank you. That comes from a morphism of monads. There's a, a morphism of monad that cor monads that corresponds to the, to the change of coefficients, which is actually induced from a semi-ring homomorphism. Oh, um, cool, okay, thank so, you. So from the non-negative reals, there's the semi-ring homomorphism to the Boolean semi-ring that just maps every positive number to one and zero to zero. That induces this. So yeah, th these discrete things are all um, kind of nice, but the actual main difficulty that uh, into the, um, doing actually doing probability theory within this this framework um, is are, are the non-discrete things. So probability is is really then measure theoretic, um, and so we also need to have some kind of measure theoretic semantics, and uh, there there there's many variations on this. Um, with different formal properties, but roughly they're all classic categories of the, of the Sherry Mona. Um, if if you don't know what what that means, don't don't worry about it. So this Finstock is is perfectly fine for for the moment, um, and then it's just the idea that that we can do something analogous um, for non-discrete mesh theoretic probability. All right, so um, what, what I'd like to do in, in the rest of the talk is that to, to sketch um, how to develop at least some theorems of probability theory um, in this framework. And <clears throat> well, mainly, I mean, or actually exclusively, I think I'll, I'll focus on um, kind of work in progress on, on the Definetti theorem, which is, as Paolo said really nicely last week, one of the flagship theorems of probability theory. Um, it's a, yeah, I'll, I'll get to what, what it means. Um, and also, if maybe enough time, I, I'd like to argue that there's some quite an unexpectedly large landscape of Markov categories that, that one can explore um, and that, that we've barely started exploring. Uh, so it's kind of these two themes, both um, developing probability theory syn synthetically or, or categorically um, and then kind of studying the, the semantics, possible semantics. Um, and in, in these two respects, I feel like the whole endeavor is, at least very roughly speaking, somehow analogous to, to Topos theory um, in, in the sense that we also have this um, feature of, of developing theorems categorically Namely, in that in a topos, every constructive piece of mathematics is valid. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also a, a very large um, landscape of possible semantics, possible toposes, where you can then instantiate those results. Um, and maybe when you encounter topos theory for the first time, unexpectedly large um, landscape of possible semantics. Um, and there's also then a hierarchy of, of additional axioms on topuses of differing strength um, with which one can do then, for example, you can postulate excluded middle, but not the axiom of choice. Um, and likewise, the same is true for Markov categories. So there's additional axioms that one can put to use um, or try to do without. Um, and as I sketched in, in sort of arriving or, or motivating the definition of Markov categories, this was purely in terms of information flow. I wasn't talking about probabilities. So in some sense, my philosophical stance here is that Markov categories are a theory of information flow, but in the same time, they're about probability theory and statistics. And so if we just apply transitivity to these equivalences, we arrive at a claim that, or at the working hypothesis that, that probability theory and statistics are really a, a theory of information flow. That that is a, 
a different perspective and we're somehow saying what what the content of, of that is. Um, and so this is actually goes back also in I, I think, I think Prakash to, to has Brandon something to say. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Prakash, go. Prakash? Maybe muted? I didn't mute him. Um, mistake, mistake. I didn't have anything to say. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay. You, My you, fault. Put up, you put up a sign. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Mistake. I was okay. trying to block the light from my eyes. <laughs> but there are simpler ways of doing that. Okay. But yeah, please speak up. If, um, um, yeah, always nice to hear from you. Um, so yeah, this goes back to, to Brandon Fong's uh, master's thesis, which somehow predates even this theory of Markov categories. Um, he had developed this categorical theory of Bayesian networks. Um, so, so yeah, Markov categories in this perspective is somehow a general setting for talking about cause and effect. All right, but now I can get a little bit more into, into the details and actually show how to, how to do a little bit of probability theory. Um, so this, this is from the Cho and Jacob's paper. Um, namely Bayes rule or, or Bayes theorem, um, or in other words, uh, c conditioning. So if you look at the equation at the bottom first, that is in some sense the usual, well, I would interpret it as definition of conditional probabilities. The conditional probability of Y given X, well, you get it from the right-hand side and then dividing by the probability of X, you take that to the other side. Um, <clears throat> And so the division is something that is not captured by Markov categories, but otherwise the equation is. And basically, the, and that is in the string diagram um, on top. And this, this defines the conditional of P, P of Y given X. We can now define it as any process or any morphism that makes this equation true. <clears throat> and so now we can use this as an, as an additional axiom on a Markov category, we can say that um, for any P of Y as on the right and any, process, any morphism P of X given Y, there should exist um, a Bayesian, a, a so-called Bayesian inverse P of Y given X that makes the equation true, that makes this equation, equation hold. Um, and then we can actually show that whenever this is the case, or um, at least in a slightly stronger form, then this map is actually a dagger, a dagger functor. But that's, um, yeah, I, I don't want to get into this um, now. Um, but I'll state the, the general definition of conditioning first, uh, because that, that, that's relevant for, for the Definetti theorem. <clears throat> so conditioning is in this information flow picture is somehow about decomposing a process into, into individual pieces. So suppose on the left, we have somehow a, a, a process that outputs um, variables X and Y given some input A and on the right would be um, the decomposition into saying that, well, you first use the process to, to compute a value for X. And once you've done that, you can use that value and the original input A, feed that into a second process, and then you can generate corresponding output for Y. And the existence, the axiom to says that such a decomposition exists for every F. And, and what this amounts to semantically is precisely the existence of conditional probabilities, um, including in the measure theoretic context in, in a suitable sense. Um, another concept that was really surprising to me when I first um, I understood this, and, and again, this is something that goes back to the Cho and Jacobs paper, um, is that one can 
formulate almost sure equality in this purely categorical language and in a really simple way. So in, in probability theory textbooks, you'll often find statements about almost, but the statements that involve the concept of almost surely. So, I mean, yeah, it comes up almost all the time. So, and meaning that a certain statement is true, but not necessarily always true, but only with probability one. The probability that it's false is zero. Also the event itself that it's false may be non-trivial. Um, and this we can capture even also in this categorical language by saying that two two morphisms F and G, we can call them P almost surely with respect to some other morphism P if this equation holds. And the way to think about this in, intuitively is to, to note that what this equation says is that um, on all the possible outputs of P, so this output gets copied and on the right, the, the corresponding copy gets sort of observed because it's an overall output whereas the left copy becomes an input for F or G. And so in, the, in this interpretation, what the equation says is, is that for all the possible outputs of P, F and G behave in the same way. But it does not mean that for all inputs of F and G, they behave in the same way. It's only for those that can occur as outputs of, outputs of F. And, and in this way, this, this is what almost surely means. Almost surely with respect to P, F and G are equal. Um, and the surprising thing is that this is even still um, in measure theoretic probability, the correct um, in, in a suitable, for suitably nice measurable spaces, even in the measure, measure theory context, this is the correct, um, has the correct semantics. Okay. Um, another important concept is the, that a morphism may or may not be deterministic. So a general morphism here is, is a, to be interpreted as um, a process that takes an input and produces a sort of random output, right? Or non-deterministic output. So then there's a special subclass of these for which the output is deterministic or determined by the input uniquely. Um, and these are characterized by, by this equation. So Paulo had already shown this last week too. Um, so this says that when you feed a copy of the same input to two independent copies of F, then you guaranteed, then if you, if you look at the thing on the right, you guaranteed to get the same outputs. So sort of if, if you run, let's say for non-deterministic automata, for example, if you run two copies in parallel, then uh, they're actually deterministic if and only if the, um, the joint output is guaranteed to be um, support basically on, on the diagonal or if, if the outputs are guaranteed to be the same. And, and so this is, this is how one can interpret the, this equation. <clears throat> and um, so then it's, it's pretty obvious and it follows straightforwardly from the definition that deterministic morphisms form um, a Cartesian monoidal subcategory. So where the monoidal structure is actually the categorical product. And um, finally, in, in this sequence of definitions, um, the last one I wanted to present is a conditional independence. So independence and, and conditional independence are also central um, concepts in, in probability theory. And so here, this is the, the categorical version of, of that. If we have a process F now with um, outputs X and Y, we can say that um, these two outputs are conditionally independent given the input A, 
meaning that if we if we sort of fix a particular value for the input, then they become completely independent if the process satisfies this equation. And so if you look at the right hand side, what this says is that um, just the output X, that, that would be the, the first box that just uh, keeps the output X and deletes the output Y. And um, on the, the box on, on the rightmost box that just um, deletes the output X and keeps the output Y, that, that these two things, if, um, if you do these independently, um, then you actually do F. So that's, that's what the equation says. And if this is true, then, then we say that um, F displays a conditional independence. So X, X and Y are sort of generated independently from the input. Um, should I go into this? Yeah, okay, so, so a general construction of, of Markov categories is from commutative monads. Um, maybe I should make this brief. Um, but I mean, I had already mentioned the Jury monad. That's a particular example of a commutative monad. Um, and pretty much any classic, well, yeah. If, if uh, we have a commutative monad, um, and it satisfies this condition that, that uh, when applied to the terminal object, we again get a terminal object. So this is basically what corresponds to normalization of probability. If this holds in its classic category is the Markov category in an obvious way, has, has the obvious structure. Um, and so this again applies to the Shiri monad and to other kinds of monads like that in mesh theory probability. And again, to the, also to the, uh, to non-determinism, if we take the non-empty power set monad. Um, so this was, I, I mentioned this mainly for, um, in order to introduce this final definition here, which I need for, to, to be able to state the Definetti theorem. Um, namely that, so in the examples, Markov categories were often closely categories, right? And so one can maybe ask, well, how general is, is this? Um, and we can also actually turn this into a definition, um, which, well, lets us in, into a sort of um, non-obvious definition that, that will let us reconstruct a Markov category as a Claisley category. Um, and that's this definition of representability. So we can say that a category C is representable if for every object X, now if you look at the, the, the bijection there on the right hand side, we just have to Holm functor into X. And so these are the general morphisms meaning non-deterministic morphisms. If these are in correspondence with deterministic morphisms into some other object Px. Um, and a notation here indicates that um, P stands for basically probability distributions uh, or a functor of probability distributions applied to X. Um, but, but so far it doesn't, it doesn't mean that Px is just another object. If it's said, if so, um, if there is a home bisection like this, um, obviously natural, then we say that the category is representable. And then one can show that P is actually a functor. And um, in that case, C turns out to be a class, and P is a functor, actually a monad, and then C turns out to be the classly category of P. Uh, author had. Um, um, or comment? Yes, you can hear me, right? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, so um, I was just curious if you, can you do this then for um, transition kernels that are normalized, but their measures are not necessarily um, positive? Can you, like, is that a yes. monad as well? Yes, ab absolutely. Ah, okay, okay, great. <laughs> I just never thought about it. 
Um, um, could I also ask if? Uh, oh, actually, so I, no, sorry. Actually, I'm not. I'm not totally sure how. Um, I suppose we can use finite. We can just do this on 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 set. So for arbitrary non finites, not necessarily finite sets, and then finitely supported probability distributions with negative probabilities. I think that would work. Okay, thank you. Uh, could I also ask uh, if you have an example of interesting cases where uh, this fails? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. So e even in the probability theory context, um, there, there, there are examples like, like that. Um, so, for example, if you take something like Gaussian probability, there is a version of this for Gaussian probability theory, and this fails. So, so Gaussian distributions are some a very special kind of distributions in probability theory. And if you restrict all distributions to being only Gaussian, then we can still set up a Markov category and, and, and do all the usual things in that category and it won't, it will not satisfy, it will not be representable. Um, but, but, but still representability is something that, that often um, is satisfied. And for the definitive theorem, we also assume it we, and we use it in the proof. So, so if you, you might just as well say that, well, let's assume that C is a classic category of a, a commutative monad satisfying this normalization condition. Um, but the, the purely closely category picture or Markov category picture that we're in here just gives a bit of a different perspective and that the focus is not on the monad um, and on the category on which the monad lives, but the focus is purely on the closely category and, and we're trying to formulate everything in, the, in, in, uh, in terms of that. Um, and one ramification of this um, way of thinking is so the co-unit, um, we also got a co-monad on C and its co-unit um, is a morphism from, so, so it com com it's co the component um, at some object X is a morphism that goes from PX to X. Uh, and this is basically in probability theory terms, this corresponds to sampling from a distribution. So now because it's a, it's a non-deterministic map, non-deterministic morphism, um, which semantically what it does is it takes a probability distribution and it returns a random element of X sampled from that distribution. And so we actually use this quite, quite a lot. Okay, so now um, I want to move on towards the Definetti theorem. Um, but I um, want to, before actually stating it in, in the traditional probability theory, mesh theory version, um, I just wanted to motivate it a, a little bit and, and, and say what, what it is about and, and, and what it means. <clears throat> um, and this is based on, this is basically Definetti's original um, thinking, which I don't know much about, but, but it seems to be actually quite, quite interesting. And they had a very particular philosophical interpretation of what probability theory is about. Um, and, but uh, yeah, um, what, what this amounts to is that suppose that I hand you a coin um, and you're not sure is the coin, is it a fair coin? And, and so, I mean, ultimately we're going to flip the coin because that's what probability theorists do. Um, but we don't assume that it's a biased coin. I've just handed you a coin and, and um, you don't know if it's biased or not. And um, so then I can ask you how much you would bet, or, or maybe someone else can ask you because I handed you the coin and I, I'm, I may know something. Um, but then how much would you bet on, let's say when a coin is flipped three times on getting a particular outcome? that it's, for example, heads, tails, and tails. And um, I phrased a question like this about how much would you bet in order to sort of force you to come up with, to come up with some kind of number. 
to come up with some kind of notion of odds in, in, in the sense of betting, um, which are in basically probabilities. Um, and obviously the answer to that should be the same as the answer to asking you how much you would bet on tails, 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 heads, because yeah, the individual throws are, are in, assumed to be independent and, and there's no reason for why they, I mean, why they wouldn't be. Um, so the, the overall number should, should be the same, should be basically permutation invariant. And finally, we can also say that, um, well, if we, actually, if we actually look at the bias of the coin, and if it has a certain probability to land heads that is given by P of heads, um, and likewise, we have pro P probability P of tails, then you would actually want to, the, the odds should be given by P of heads times P of tails times P of tails. Right, which is multiplier probabilities like, like usual when we look at independent events. Um, but now we don't know what P actually is. We don't have a particular distribution because you don't know whether the coin is biased or not and, and what the bias is. So um, that means the P itself, the measure P itself is kind of random. Um, if you if you're if you're a Bayesian, um, then you would have a certain distribution over the, the possible values of this distribution p. So the p itself becomes a random measure, which itself has a certain distribution mu. Um, and in that way, the overall odds would be you also have to average over p with respect to that distribution mu. Um, and so then the overall odds are given by that integral down there. Is that um, kind of, yeah, pl please interrupt if it's um, maybe too, too unusual for, for um, what sort of thing you usually think about. And I can try to explain it again. Um, actually, yeah, is mu the uniform prior that you would start with, like before you started throwing the, the coin? Mm -hmm. I, I, I've kept it a little vague and, and I, I mean, it, it could be, right, it could be some sort of uniform prior, some sort of distinguished prior, but, but you can have an arbitrary prior. Uh, I just wanted to have an, an idea of what roughly the shape um, of this, how, how one goes about this at all. So the particular form of the prior is not, I'm, I'm not concerned with that here. Um, and I would say that you can take any prior if, as a sort of, as a Bayesian, the prior is up to you. It's quite interesting that you're using distributions on distributions. Yes, right. <laughs> and, and, and that's what monads are good for, right? Or we can easily iterate now. Our it's natural to use here. monads here. It is natural to use monads in this yep. setting. Right, exactly. Okay, so now here's the general um, statement, the, the classical version of the theorem. Um, and this basically says that, so here in this case, the, there were these two observations. On the one hand, I had, I had noticed the, this permutation variance, but on the other hand, we have this particular form for the probability given by that integral. Uh, and this is obviously satisfies the permutation variance. So now we can ask how are these two properties related? Um, the, the integral form implies the permutation variance, but how about the converse? Um, and this is what Definetti's theorem says, if now instead of just having three coin flips, Suppose that we have infinitely many. In probability theory, we often do infinite things, look, look at asymptotics. Um, so suppose that we have infinitely many, then these two things are indeed equivalent. So if we have now a whole sequence of random variables, um, which take values in some space X, which in the coins example would have been just the, the two elements set heads and tails, 
Um, and then we have some distribution for these, which just means now a probability measure on the infinite product space um, of X with, with itself. And suppose that this distribution is invariant under permutations or, or technically well under finite permutations. So when we look at any N, let's say the just the first N variables and what their probabilities are, then that is invariant under under just um, yeah per permuting these variables or, or equivalently these components of the product. And so the theorem says that if uh, this permutation variance holds called, called exchangeability, um, then it has that kind of integral over the measures form. So then there exists. Um, um, a measure mu on the space of measures or, or distributions such that it has it has that form. And, and yeah, the general idea is basically from, from the previous slide. We can think of this as now sequence of tosses of a coin, um, which has an unknown bias. And, and this is sort of what, um, of course, is given by the integral that, that we average over that bias. But for, for, that for a given P, they're independent. And so inside the integral, we have just a, a, a product over these individual um, variables. Um, sorry, very yeah. basic question. If um, suppose like, so when you say an unknown bias, does that mean like, I don't know, 30% chance heads, 70% chance tails, like it's an exact or maybe the person who's flipping the coin may have like choices like, oh, maybe half the time they'll flip it with this bias, half the other time they'll flip it with that so that you can average out over all possible measures. Mm -hmm. it, it, it could be either. Okay. So, and then if you have um, large N. And, and, and in your first case, the mu would be a delta measure, right? Right, like exactly, these. exactly. So now when N is really large, would I expect this probability to approach that um, the exact probability that I should expect? Um, I think you don't mean the, the probability, but you mean the relative frequency, right? Right, yeah. Yes, yes. And that, that's exactly what figures into the proof. Right. I see. Okay. So, so the proof basically proceeds by, by looking at um, the relative frequencies of heads versus tails. Um, and then you can sort of reconstruct the measure mu from from that. So another another way to reconstruct the measure would also to be to take the sequence of measurements, right? And then do Bayesian inference on that and then approach an answer in that way as well? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by... Oh, okay, never mind. I, we can maybe discuss later then. Yeah, yeah, please. It, 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 um, um, it, it, it may well be something very similar to what we actually do. Yeah. I see. Thank um, you. We're sort of taking conditionals, uh, conditional of, let's say, x1, given all the other ones. I see. Th th that's part of, um, part, part of the proof. <clears throat> okay, so, so then um, to state our general categorical version, um, there's a, this is just still a, a preparation slide before I get to the statement. Um, so the assumptions are actually surprisingly weak on the Markov category. I'm, I'm still somehow a little bit suspicious that maybe, I mean, it's, it kind of seems almost too, too weak to, to, to be, for this to imply the Definetti theorem, um, because there isn't actually anything about probability theory in there. Um, so just basically we assume the representability in a slightly stronger form you know, that, I haven't, that I haven't shown. Um, so almost surely compatible representability. Uh, we assume the existence of conditionals, the thing that I had shown, shown in the beginning. Um, and we assume the existence of um, what we call countable Kolmogorov products. That just means that these infinite, that we can talk about infinite powers and inf infinite 
So, so I mean, we're in a monodal category, so we can take finite pro monodal products of things, but with these Kolmogorov products, we can also take infinite, in this case, countable tensor products of objects. Yeah, and, and then, um, so the theorem is about um, morphisms from F, from, from any object A, to you know, such an infinite power, um, let's say countable power, that the cardinality itself doesn't actually matter, but, but the exp as long as it's infinite, so just some infinite power of X, and, and this plays the role of the exchangeable distribution here, the, the P, the bold face P. Um, and we say that this is exchangeable if it's invariant under, you know, well, composing with finite permutations of these tensor factors. Um, yeah, and then ultimately we want to have something like that integral decomposition. And that involves the morphism that I've drawn at the bottom here. So this goes from Px to that infinite product uh, so this basically, semantically, it means that it takes a distribution and um, returns infinitely many samples from it, independent samples. And that is basically exactly what's, what's going on here and under the integral, that for a given bias of the coin P, well, we just take these, uh, we basically take in N flips and samples from that distribution P. Uh, and so this is the abstract version of, um, of that under the integrant. And so now here's the, here's the theorem statement. Um, for every exchangeable F, there is a G, and, and now this corresponds to, to the mu from before, which goes uh, from A to PX, so keep in mind that this is still a Kleisler morphism. So at a level of um, the, the, the deterministic category, this would actually go from A to PPX, would be a distribution over distributions indexed by A, um, such, such that this equation holds. And here the integral, um, from here is now kind of buried in the composition of G with that infinite infinite sampling map. So the, that's because composition in, um, basically means amounts to integration. I had shown this at the beginning, the chapman Kolmogorov equation. Uh, and so that's, that's how we arrive at this form. Okay, I think I should be um, wrapping up soon. Um, but I can, yeah, I can, I can go into the details of the proof if anyone's interested, but here, so here's the rough structure of the proof, um, just to give a sort of um, idea of how, um, yeah, that, that it's not just, you can't just do it in two lines or something. Um, it has some depth and, and which is also, I guess, explains why it took us a couple of months to, to find this. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's nice in that uh, I, I think these individual parts of the proof still um, have meaning, meaning on their own and can still be used in other contexts too. Um, and I hope that ultimately this can make the theorem or the, the proof of the theorem actually a little, a little bit less obscure because in the probability theory literature, the, the proof seems to be considered a little obscure and, and, and there's still very recent papers uh, with titles like an elementary proof of Definetti's theorem. And, and so the whole argument seems to be, and, and there's different versions of it, seems, seems to be considered somewhat um, difficult to approach. And, and so hopefully our proof can um, alleviate that situation a little because it's categorical. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I had a few more slides on, let's say this, the landscape of Markov categories, but maybe I should just kind of skip this and, and um, wrap up. 
And if anyone wants to hear about that, I can, I can say a little bit about it. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah. Tobias, uh, just uh, um, oh, so you showed us all the slides. So if we watch it on YouTube, we can stop it and read to to everybody. Okay. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So yeah, let me let me try to summarize a little. So these Markov categories are an approach to to categorical probability, and it seems to be um, a particularly promising one in that there are. Um, a couple of theorems, classical theorems of probability and statistics that have now been proven um, in, in purely categorical terms using Markov categories. Uh, and so these, these results are, are typically, though, so, um, qualitative in, in the sense that unlike so many of the theorems of probability, like the central limit theorem, are quantitative and, and really hard quantitative results. We don't have anything like that yet, but there's also qualitative statements like the Finetti theorem, and these seem to be quite amenable to such a categorical treatment. Um, and yeah, we need then additional axioms, of course, uh, I guess unsurprisingly. Um, and there's some, at least an intuitive, some kind of similarity analogy with Topos theory. Um, okay, yeah, I think I should I should stop here. So. Yeah, thanks for listening and, and all the questions. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, let's just thank the speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Gershon, go fire away. Okay, yeah. So I have a question slash observation thing, um, which is in the last talk on this and even more in this one, right, where you highlighted the correspondence to Cleisley, um categories that, that often but not always exists. Something that struck me, even just looking at the Markov diagrams before you hit the Cleisley thing, was that, I mean, you know, this is designed to treat probability, and you said, well, more generally, information flow. Mm. But it really <laughs> looks an awful lot to me like a, a theory of computational effects, right? And, you know, of course, stochastic processes or probability are, are a, a typical canonical example of a computational effect, but not mm. the only one, right? Swap out rolling a die for asking a user to type in input. And you have a lot of these same questions of pure, i.e. deterministic or impure things and all of that. And then the correspondence to Markov category, uh, category is really kicked into gear because of course, that is how one does computational effects <laughs> is classically categories of monads. And so then I guess my question slash observation would be like, you know, um, have people thought about this and just said, you know, gee, we've got at least three different stories for computational effects. Uh, the algebraic story, uh, the, the monad story directly, uh, is, is this, uh, do Markov categories really give another story? And also from that, you know, sort of the induced, uh, what does the induced type theory of a Markov category look like, right? Is that, that version of sort of categorical logic, one thing that more than even your proof, what I'd love to see would be, um, if you could give the type of the definitive theorem, right? As a, <laughs> you know, it, it's a statement that, you know, two equations in some probabilistic logic are in correspondence. That, that, mm -hmm. might, that might be really pleasant just to read, mm -hmm. um, like giving a concrete syntax to it. Mm -hmm. So, all right, th there we go. That's my rambling. You can put it Yeah, thanks. Um, well, th th there's a whole lot in there and, and I'm not sure if I can do it justice to, to all of that. Um, so as far as, well, yeah, computational effects are concerned, I'm, I'm not much of a, well, I'm not at all a computer scientist. So I'm not sure how much I can say about that. Um, but, but certainly Markov categories are um, not generic Claisley categories, right? There, there are a particular kind of Claisley categories actually with extra structure with these copy and, and, and deletion maps. Um, and so maybe one can say that they model a particular type of computational effect. Um, because so then, they, yeah, and, and the representable case that correspond to commutative, I mean, as being classic categories of commutative affine monads. Um, so, so it's a little bit more, more specific. 
Um, the, the type theory, I, I, I don't know, I have to say. I, yeah, I mean, I think I would like to see that too, <laughs> but, but I don't know. Um, and I, I think that, well, there, there, there are other people in the audience who, who may well be able to comment more on, on, on these things, so maybe um, they, they can say more. But w one thing that I had wanted to say um, was that as far as the Definetti theorem is concerned, and a potential translation of it into a sort of type theory or maybe programming um, language sort of thing and, and, and to, um, is that this definition of the existence of conditionals, which is one of the, um, the axioms that, that, that we use and, and that seems to be really a, a central ingredient, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that it, that it can be written in a nice way as an inference rule because it's an existential statement. Um, it just says there exists such an F um, given X. Um, and this F given X is, is really cannot be made unique, um, at, at least not in any obvious way. So, so in order to translate this into, into type theory style, I think one would have to do concerning this axiom some, some more work. And, and this is not, not obvious at all. Does this kind of address uh, the questions? Um, it's given me something to chew on, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, yeah, and, and maybe uh, maybe Prakash or, or, or someone wants to, or, or Paolo wants to uh, expand on um, the computational effects. Not me. <laughs> A any other questions? Arthur has a question. Um, yeah, sorry for all of these questions. Uh, I And forgive me if I asked you this before, but I may have forgotten the answer if I did at some point. Um, in the proof of the Definetti theorem, or even in the statement, it didn't seem that you used explicitly the fact that you needed your Markov category to be the quasi category of a monad, but it seems like you did explicitly need to use the fact that you had something that you would call a sampling morphism. Um, is that, is it really that you need this Kleisley category or do you need a sampling map that has a lot of properties that's similar to the one that you get from having a, a Kleisley category? Mm -hmm. so, so one thing that I can say is that there are different versions of the Definetti theorem. Uh, and this one is in some sense, particularly strong version because here, this, this does reference representability, right? So, so the PX appears in here and, and the sampling map. And it's a strong version in the sense that it actually uses those particular structures. So, so you can factor the F in exactly that form using, well, the sampling map that comes from the representability. Um, but there's a weaker form of the theorem, which would say that, um, there's just a given exchangeable morphism F just has some form as on the right hand side, where instead of the sampling map, there would be an arbitrary morphism. Um, and instead of the PX there would just be an arbitrary object. And so this basically amounts to saying that semantically speaking, what, what, what that means is the statement that um, an exchangeable distribution is conditionally IID. So it's conditionally um, independent and identically distributed because then instead of the sampling map on all these wires, we would have to say morphism. So this is sort of in probability theory terms means IID. Um, and, and, and that would be, uh, th that is a weaker version of the theorem, which we actually prove first in the proof. Um, so, so the proof proceeds through that. And this is in particular a, a version which I could imagine that that can be, maybe our proof can be adapted to the quantum case. Um, I'm not sure about that. I see. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, I think we should thank the speaker again. Thank you, it was really, it was a great speech. Then it's, it's very nice. Um, uh, Ross Street is going to be speaking April 14th.
Um, nobody till then. So we're looking forward to seeing you all. You're welcome to come join us again. Okay, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks again. Bye, Tobias.